did um, read a book called Flower Confidential. Talked about the cut flower industry and how they breed these plants to be certain colors, to be certain um, heights, things like that. They breed them for the wedding industry. They actually breed plants so that they won't drop their pollen, so they don't get the tables at a wedding reception. Oh, pollen. Okay, think how useful that is to a person. Not very. But when you, when you are buying non-native species or cultivars, a lot of times in the breeding process, the nectar amount has been greatly reduced. So if you are interested in buying something and you'd like to see whether it's going to be a good pollinator plant, go to an open air garden center and just stand there and watch and see if any insects come to those plants. Okay? If they're, if they're going to be viable and they're sending out their signals to insects, you know, come over here, this is, you know, eat it Joe's kind of thing, then the insects will come. Uh, we did an experiment several years ago between the butterfly bush of the yellow variety and the dark night of the purple variety, even though that's not a native plant here, it is a butterfly magnet. And we found that when they bred the yellow one, there's hardly any nectar in it, and then the butterflies went to the yellow one. They systematically always picked the purple one. So it can be things like that. So it's part of the breeding process to be part of the problem here. That's why natives are very, very important. And natives that are used from classic varieties. And then again, you want to use plants whose blooms will peak at different times in the season. So you want stuff in the spring, you want stuff in the summer, and you certainly want things in the fall that are blooming that will help those monarchs on their way down. You want to attract them to your site when they're on their way back or when they come up by having plants in the early part of the summer. Because if you get them to come to nectar on your plants and you have milkweed, they likely will stay and lay their eggs on your plants. And again, you want to include plants that will be both useful to the adult for the nectar sources and then the caterpillars for the food sources. For example, this is a black swallowtail caterpillar. When it got too big for this skin, it just shed it and that's just kind of laying there. It's not a dead one, it's just the skin. Um, one of the little kids thought it was a sock, a caterpillar sock. I thought that was kind of interesting. Okay. And again, you want to avoid excessive mowing. Um, I have a neighbor who mows his grass every three days, whether he needs it or not. He likes riding on his tractor, but and he doesn't want anything messy. He doesn't want a plant that's leaning over. He doesn't want a plant that might have holes in the leaves. So, but he's a photographer. He likes to take pictures. So he really manicures his lawn. He sprays a bunch of things or has a bunch of things sprayed. And then when he wants to take pictures, he comes in my yard. And he asks me if he can take pictures of my butterflies and my messy plants that he would never have in but, so, to each his own in that regard, but for those of you that really want to enhance it, there's a lot of things you can do to make it better. And again, aim for diversity. The more species, the more you're going to get in, in species of plants, in species of insects, and in species of birds. Remember, as, as you have more insects in your area or in a park or things like that, you're going to get more birds. Because a lot of the birds come here, I have a great bluebird population because I've seen caterpillars. So they come to, they know that there's going to be stuff to eat in a yard that has a lot of diversity and has a lot of varying types of flowers. And again, you always want to provide water, believe it or not. Uh, even in a bird bath or the other thing you do that's really important for butterflies is a sandy or a muddy area that's just a little bit wet because all of the male butterflies have to get their chemical components from like muds or Believe it or not, uh, the animals, the roadkill, or dog food, things like that. There's very important minerals in that organic stuff. Thankfully, ladies, it's just the male that do that. But we have to have them do that because then they put that in the sperm pack and pass it on to the girls. And the girls have to be able to lay the eggs with all the right chemicals. So the water is very important. Wet soil that you just take a sprinkling can in the morning and just water it. And anytime you see a butterfly cuddling on the ground, you know that that's going to be a male butterfly. And they get involved with organizations that are aimed at helping the monarchs, including habitat preservation and planting native milk species. Go ahead. We're almost done. Kate is coming soon. And then you want to work with your local park districts or community areas, schools, colleges, things like that, to encourage planting of milk leaves and other pollinator from the species. In a, in a bigger area that covers more than just your yard. So it could, you know, definitely it could be a park, it could be um, around retirement community, things like that. If you can think of a place where one would work, you know, there's a lot of volunteers out there that could help. The scouts, 
you know, our, our little able-bodied group. So things like that can, can really be very, very important. And then you want to work toward creating joint areas in which monarch-friendly areas can be near where families or children are playing. So if you have a park, what about a play garden in that park? Near the swing sets or near, you know, where the kids are going to be. Because I can guarantee you, if you give kids a swing set and you give them an area where they go look at a butterfly. Nine times out of ten, the kids that we deal with, they all run over with a butterfly. Or they look at other things that might be over there. So, you know, you can, you can make it a win-win situation like that. Get involved in your own neighborhood. Get more of your neighbors to plant things. And, you know, you have to educate them to do that. These are things that we do our butterfly counts, and we invite families to come on our butterfly counts. And here's this little girl with a little dragonfly. This little girl has been carrying this butterfly on her finger for the longest time, and then it flew away, so she picked up a dandelion. So, you know, there's, there's always something to look at. And again, um, if you're not familiar with what's going on in your area, the best way to find out what's coming is go to the zoning meeting. Go to your local zoning meetings and find out what companies are, are trying to get a new building put in somewhere. And see if you can't talk to the commissioners or your county trustees, things like that. And, and have them write in a requirement that if they do so much building, then they need to put in the sale pollinator when they have that. These are all things that you can do and, and could be very, very helpful. There's also a monarch tagging program. We do this, we do a couple hikes every year for this. We'll be doing another one this year where we go out to catch the monarchs and put the little tags on. They, they don't weigh very much. They head on down to Mexico, and when the tags are found, they send them into the clearinghouse and then they notify you. And several years ago, I had two of mine that were found down in Mexico. It was great rejoicing all around because it was like, yay, we made it. Uh, so I had, it's through the Monarch Watch program. And you can you know, get yourself some tags and you can learn how to do it. Uh, like I said, we do it through the museum. We do several hikes where we teach kids and families how to do it. Go ahead. Now, these are the native Ohio milkweed species. You can, and then I'm going to take a screenshot. I can give that list to Kathy. She can distribute it. Now, there's, you'll see there's two butterfly weeds in here with two different varieties. The only one that's not in there is that, that honey vine that I talked about. But that's one you can look up. So there's approximately 13 or 14 species, depending on if you separate those two. And then, go to the next one. And then if you're interested in finding out things, information on Ohio milkweeds, uh, Andrew Gibson, he's one of the botanists down in Southern Ohio. He's got a fabulous blog, and he talks about all kinds of things. But he's got a great, one of his blogs, talks about the milkweeds of Ohio. Very good site to check out. You can learn a lot from it. Information on monarchs in general, the Monarch Watch, um, the Monarch Watch newsletter, the Xerxes Society, um, vertebrate conservation, all those are very, very good. I mean, I could list many, and I, you know, we don't have enough time, but these are some of the better ones. And then information on buying milk and seeds and plants, um, the Ohio Prairie Nursery. And then if you go into, we have a consortium within Northeast Ohio called LEAP, the Lake Erie Allegheny Partnership. Many of the park districts and land conservancies belong to it, but there's a really great map on that site that shows all the nurseries in the area that carry native plants. And you can click in these little dots with numbers, and you can click on them and find one near you, and you can check them to see what might be in your area and you can purchasing it. And remember, everything is interconnected. So what we do here has lasting effects elsewhere. It's very important that we try to do our best. I mean, Monarch, when, when President Obama actually gets out there and gives a good word to, you know, invertebrates and pollinators that we should be doing something, we know that it's going to take off. We know that it's something that's going to be nationwide. And, you know, what better than to be ahead of the pack by doing things here in Northeast Ohio, because we are a major flyway. Believe it or not, we get the Canadian species, we get a lot that come from, like me and that, because they fly along the southern edge of the Great Lakes. So we're a very, very pivotal geographic area, and what we do to make great deal of Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Judy. That, that was wonderful. Um, does anybody have any questions now? Yes, sir. What is the attitude of the Mexican government for the preservation of habitat? Very good question. 
What is the attitude of the Mexican government? We have many groups here in North America that are working with them. The biggest thing is funding, because they get money by cutting down trees or growing coffee, things like that, and they're trying to show them that tourism for nature is much, much more in the way of revenue for them. So we're trying to get them to not cut down their forests and on private property. If they have these trees that the monarch can go to, we're, they're trying to actually get people to go on trips to visit them so that they can get an income based on natural history tourism. They're also trying to put together a subsidy program where instead of them cutting them down or illegally cutting them down, they're trying to then you know try to pay them or subsidize them so that they will try to keep them intact. It's little by little, it's, they're trying to get better, but you know some of those are the things we can't control, like the weather that might have happened in you know, a season. But the biggest thing are the trees and that area. If that area dries out, or if those trees start to die because of other practices around it, you know there could be problems. So there is, a, there is quite a contingent that's trying to get the Mexican government to you know, work with the people. And like I said, the, the idea of getting natural history tourism down there can be a really good thing. Yes, sir. Well, the mosquito spraying, what they're trying to do there, they do that where I live too, unfortunately, but what, what we need to do is we need to get people not to leave their buckets of water out, things like that, because a lot of things you can do in your own yard that would help the mosquito problem considerably. Uh, and it's not just, for example, one of our preserved Singer Lake over by the Eckerkant Airport, um, part of the property that we couldn't protect turned into a housing development. And the first lots that were sold were lots that were along the glacial lakes or the, or the kettle box that were there. So everybody built their big house and they put a big deck hanging out over the water up to the point where they could do that. And then they proceeded to have their yard sprayed or they had, had it fertilized. And they took the grass clippings and dumped them in the water. Well, the chemicals on the grass killed the insects in the water that normally eat the mosquito larvae. So after about the second or third or fourth year, they all sat on their porch and complained about the mosquitoes. So they called the museum. And they said, why do I have so many mosquitoes here? I want you to come and kill them. Well, we're not going to spray a preserve or you know, protected area. But we tried to educate them and say, well, here's what has happened. Because of these chemicals and the nitrogen that you've added to the water, now the surface is covered with various algae and things like that that were growing even faster because of the chemicals and the fact that you killed a lot of the insects in the water, dragonfly larvae, things like that, that would kill the mosquito larvae, that was a big problem. Well, now most of them that now live along the lake, they no longer do that. And certainly, I don't know if they still spray, but they're not dumping the grass clippings in the water. And the wetlands are considerably better. The, you know, now there's open water and there's insects in the water that are you know, eating the creatures. But as far as trying to get with the city to figure out you know, if that's bothering them. It's not so much, they usually spray at night, okay? And most of the monarchs are not free flying at night, they're usually down for the evening somewhere. They don't typically fly at all at night. But I think it's difficult because a lot of sprays of any sort, just they're out there to kill mosquitoes. It's just the same thing with the bug lights. They had, everybody bought a bug light and they thought they would kill the mosquitoes and all the bug light did was attract moths and they killed all the moths. Because mosquitoes aren't attracted to light, they're attracted to body heat. That's why they go after us, because we're warm, we taste good, we have blood, okay? There's not much for them to look at or want in a, in a bug light. So part of what we do, we need to know what we're doing before we do it. We need to get the education out there to people to say, okay, this is what you can do, this is what you shouldn't do, and here's why. Um, something that you can do, like in the city, is you can ask them, okay, what are you spraying with? Do you want the exact, and they have to give you that information because they're spraying, you know, public areas and that's public information. They have to tell you exactly what they're spraying with. And you can actually look that up and you can go back to them and say, look, this is this, this is this, this causes this, this causes this, this. You know, they really don't want you to spray them. Well, the reason that they're spraying is because of the various mosquito-borne diseases, which now people are getting, but, a lot of that could be curtailed dramatically if people would change what they do in their own yards. And that is, you know, leaving water out for days at a time. And the 
mosquitoes or having a pond that maybe doesn't have uh, something that moves the water because a mosquito larva has its breathing tube at the end of its body. That's why it goes up to the surface. So when there's no motion on the water, like a, you know, like a, a waterfall or one of those little sprayers that continually move the top of the water, that's where the mosquitoes look for. So old fires, things where the water's going to be not moving. Great place for mosquitoes. That's why for those of you that have rain gardens or water, you know, water buckets off of your downspots, they always put a screen over them. Because unless it's raining and that water's moving, you know, you know that would be a spot. But you the screen is over them, prevents all that from happening. And if you, you know, if you have dragonfly larvae, if you have a pond that has dragonfly larvae and you have a bucket of water out and you catch mosquito larvae, you can just put it in the pond because the fish will eat them and you know, there are natural biological controls in mosquitoes. But because now we get lazy, it's just like leaving food out with our trash and then we have all these raccoons, you know, everything is all connected. Same thing with the mosquitoes. But that's something that you can do to get their attention. You should find out what's in, what they're spraying, find out when they spray, and you can, you can actually make a really good case for that. I'm, I'm working with a, a condominium development that wants them to stop spraying around their homes because of allergies and dog deaths and things like that. And that's how we're starting now. Yes, sir. Um, there are butterflies that overwinter as adults. They're not migratory, like morning floats and things like that. They'll hide in wood piles and behind the bark. But as far as migratory butterflies, no. Yeah, the monarchs are really the only ones. There are migratory dragonflies, but in the butterfly world, it's pretty much the monarch. The other ones either complete everything in a season and then hatch the next year, but they don't really fly from that place. Yes? Yes? Is there a breeding cycle on the migration? On the migration? There is when they come back, but there isn't on the way down. So for those that are in Mexico, they come in the spring, they basically make it to about northern Mexico and Texas, they find friends, they mate, they lay eggs, those hatch, that's why it takes them so long to get here. So it's that second generation that comes here, okay, that, that are mating along the way. So the butterflies in Mexico, when they start to come back, those are not the butterflies we see here, it's their offspring. So the butterflies that go back to Mexico from here, that's a full shot field all the way down. They don't meet on the way or anything like that. They just fly all the way straight down. That's the third generation. That's the second generation for those that would be born along the way. So it's the adults in Mexico, play eggs and have offspring like in Texas and northern Mexico and you know Louisiana, those states there. And they may lay eggs. That offspring then comes to Ohio. Make lay eggs. Those little guys then fly back to Mexico. Good question. That's a lot of people think that they're mating along the way and they're back and they don't. Yes. Two questions. Okay. Um, how long does an adult fly the water to the second? I have swamp milkweed and those are the little orange uh, infants, I guess. No. Okay. So yeah. milkweed bugs. Is that, is that her? Okay. Her first question is. How long does the adult live? Well, it could be anywhere from an hour to, if it's one that's going down, you can make it all the way to Mexico, many days, okay? But here, the group that we have that had this year that'll fly down, if they get lucky, they'll make it all the way down, so they'll live a long time. Okay, those that come up, let's say they have to Texas or Louisiana and they're coming up to Ohio, hopefully they make it long enough to get into Ohio. Many of the other butterflies, there's so many things that can happen to them. They can live a day, they can live many days, but the monarchs, being migratory, tend to live longer than any of the other butterflies. Your second question was, are the little orange bugs that are on her milkweed? There's a whole host of milkweed bugs that are orange and black. They are not, they are sap sucking bugs. They don't bite anything, they don't have teeth, they don't have jaws, they don't have anything. They just live to suck the sap of the milkweed. They don't bother the butterflies, they don't bother the eggs, and there's all kinds of other little creatures. You might see those little fuzzy caterpillars in your milkweed, the little tusk moths, milkweed tusk moths. They're not going to hurt anything either. They just, they're another one that'll feed on that, and they'll, you'll find sometimes they'll feed right next to a monarch caterpillar. So they don't bother anything either. Any other questions? Okay. 
thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. I know you've all been sitting a long time, so um, we're going to have some cake right now. I need to know wants to say a couple words. Um, I'll give us right back to you guys. But uh, a couple of quick things. Uh, September 20, if you enjoy the day of program, September 20, the Middlefield Library is about the same time. Kim Kaufman from Black Swamp Bird uh, Observatory is going to be giving a presentation. She does a wonderful job at Singer. And more importantly, we have a booth at the fair. And we need volunteers to fill in some time. So if you uh, can give us about three hours one afternoon or a couple afternoons, we would appreciate it. Uh, my wife back there is keeping track, so uh, uh, please uh, keep that in mind for us, all right? Yeah. Thank you, Drew. And let's have another big hand for the for, for <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and feel free to walk around, socialize, check out the merchandise. Um, please have some cake. We don't want to take cake okay, home. Okay. Um, so there's there there is water, there's iced tea, there's lemonade and cake. So please help yourselves. Please meet your neighbors. Thank you so much for being here.